Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood. The Iowa History 101 webinar series, which focuses on the past lives of Iowans, continues on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will learn about life in Iowa in the 1920s and early 1930s, and the various conflicts concerning music, dancing, immigration, and race, as well as how these cultural clashes relate to longstanding trends in American society. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came on into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, State Curator Leo Landis. Leo has his Bachelor's of Science in History from Iowa State University and a Master's of Arts in Historical Administration from Eastern Illinois University. He has completed all but his dissertation towards a PhD in history from Iowa State. His museum experience includes time at Living History Farms in Urbandale, Connor Prairie in Fishers, Indiana, and eight years as curator at Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. He has also worked as Curator and Director of Education at Salisbury House in Des Moines. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Leo to begin the webinar. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you to everyone joining us today and anybody listening uh, to the recording. Great to have you being part of our program on Iowa and the Jazz Age. And, you know, I picked the topic because it's something that was important to us at the Historical Society as we did our work on the World War I exhibit. And, and you have to look at the 20s, of course, just like all history in the context of what was happening before. And prior to the year 1920, and in that year as well, you had the World, the world War or the Great War, and that disrupted life across the globe. You also then had a global pandemic with the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919. And in 1920, then you had a set of events taking place in the United States that certainly shaped life for Iowans. And so uh, women received the vote in our state, or, or at least Iowa uh, finally joined the rest of the, the nation in ratifying the 19th Amendment. So women became part of the electorate for the first time for uh, elections with candidates. Uh, prohibition comes into effect. And so that's another factor. And then there will be a few other things that I'll reference as we begin. But what you see already then by 1920 is this concern that American society and life in Iowa is changing. And so on the left side of the screen, you see the clipping that was originally a, a little column in the Iowa Falls Citizen, but ran in the Webster City Freeman, a paper in Hamilton County, so the Webster City paper just north of Des Moines uh, a little bit, and talking about immorality. And, and that's really part of the concern that's happening through the 20s. And so the Iowa Falls newspaper had said, complaint is being made that the country is being swept by a wave of immorality, that the nights are being marred with orgies of crime, that young girls are being enticed away and ruined, and that the dancing mania is rampant everywhere and that the ordinary rules of decent behavior are becoming lax and loose. Germany is being horrified by naked dancing, perhaps a natural sequence of the war. Fathers and mothers and brothers can do so much, can do much in this country by insisting on proper rules of decorum. It is the life of your sister, not somebody else's sister that is at stake. And so rather than reading everything to you, 
by 1920, jazz music had, had been around, but there's new hairstyles that are coming in, uh, new entertainment that's coming in, jazz music, new styles of dancing, uh, and, and other factors that are viewed as threats to American society and changing life as it had been known before the war or in a better time. And so uh, Ding Darling, the longtime cartoonist for the Des Moines Register uh, in 1926, you know, takes it away from the blame from putting it on young people in a cartoon and shows the younger generation following in the footsteps of the older generation and, and the younger generation uh, the young woman and the young man dressed like a couple of swells, or at least he's dressed like a swell, and she's dressed as a flapper with a short skirt above the knees, bobbed hair. Uh, but you look at the older generation uh, that Darling is, is depicting, and it's their footsteps that the youth are walking in. And, and that struck me as, uh, with the title as the tree is bent, the twig is inclined, you know, saying, Historically, there's always been concern about how life is changing in our nation and our state. And usually things have been okay. Uh, so the concerns uh, may be just reflecting and, and a forgetfulness of uh, maybe rebellion or uh, changing standards from an earlier generation. So uh, really, thought the, the Ding Darling cartoon was a good uh, way to show that. But what is happening nationally and in Iowa is Iowa is becoming more and more urban. It's actually not until 1960 that the urban population exceeds the rural population in Iowa. But putting up a graph just giving you a chance to see how that shift is getting closer and closer. So if you go back to 18. 60, 18, 50, you know, it's, it's uh, a percentage that's, that's pretty uh, uh, distinct where, you know, 30% of the population is going to be uh, urban and 70% is going to be rural. Nationally, that actually changes in the year 1920. Uh, the phrase that gets used by some uh, historians is from Richard Hofstetter saying that the United States was born in the country but grew up uh, than in, in town or in, in cities. And, and that's what shift is happening in 1920 nationally, doesn't really turn in Iowa till 1960. But again, more and more urban rural differences taking place in our state and coming to a head in the 1920s and 1930s. And the Library of Congress has a, a set of uh, cabinet cards, excuse me, uh, stereo cards that uh, used this image of a Iowa farm. And so you see a windmill in the background, corn cribs, uh, Iowa farmsteads still in 1920 are largely unelectrified, uh, lack indoor plumbing. They're lovely places to uh, live, but are not having the same access to some of the both social and cultural and technological innovations that are happening in urban areas. And so the differences in, in some of the cultural tension that's taking place to a degree is happening because of an urban rural divide, but that's not to say that it, it's strictly that way. Uh, there are other factors that come, come into play, but uh, example of a nice Iowa farmstead uh, that is, is in the collection of the Library of Congress. Two things that are really disrupting American life and life in Iowa is the automobile and allowing greater transportation access. Uh, decided to play off uh, a GM car, the Chevrolet against the Fordson tractor because those are two uh, things that transform life to a degree for rural Iowans is having affordable automobiles, whether it be the Model T or in this case, uh, Chevrolet, uh, Model 490 is the, the base Chevrolet automobile from General Motors and competing with the Model T as a affordable car. And so more and more rural Iowans purchasing automobiles and trucks for the farm. And then tractors are also transforming productivity and farming on Iowa farmsteads. And so uh, the ad actually came from a Denison paper and 
this is part of the tension then that's going to you know, cause disruption on the farm is you aren't needing as much hired work or horses to do the work. So from this Denison, Iowa newspaper, you know, farmers saying plowed 154 acres with their horse and tractor, 11 acres plowed in 9.2 hours, where you know five acres to uh, behind a team of horses is, is going to be uh, uh, about about typical. And disked 354 acres, dragged 500 acres, threshed with a Wood Brothers separator because the tractor would have had an attachment called a, a pulley that mounted on the side that would allow you to power stationary items like a threshing machine. Wood Brothers were out of Des Moines. Uh, and so a thousand bushels of oats in nine hours. And so the productivity that you're gaining by using tractors, whether it be a Fordson or a John Deere Waterloo Boy or a Farmall or a Case or uh, Aulis Chalmers or Oliver Tractor, uh, Hart Parr out of Charles City, all of those factors on the farm are transforming what rural life is like and thus uh, Iowa life when you've got still at that time more than 60% of, of Iowans living on, on the farm. And as I said, you, you've got even into the 1940s with uh, Iowa farm women cooking on wood burning stoves or coal burning stoves. So that transformation that starts in the 1920s in urban areas is still uh, not fully transformed the farmstead. And so a nice Pete Wedick photo here of a, a farm, a pair of farm women in Southeast Iowa doing some canning. Uh, in, in 1940. So just realizing that some of those transitions that had been happening in towns across our state and across the nation on the farm still aren't uh, being felt even through the efforts of rural electrification in the 1930s. Uh, but industry really is taking off in urban areas. So a, a nice example of the Maytag factory, but you had factories all across our state, the Maytag factory in Newton, of course, and having uh, uh, greater industrialization, the moving assembly line really took off with Henry Ford and the Highland Park plant mass producing Model T automobiles in the 19 teens, late 19, mid to late 19 teens. And so after the war, mass production of consumer objects, while it had been part of the industrial revolution, the moving assembly line in Iowa factories is, is starting to uh, take hold as well in the 1920s. So work is, is being transformed, not just on the farm, but in, in urban areas as well. And that leads to that disruption that we were talking about. And one of the terms besides flapper that was being used was, was vamps. And uh, an article that was published in the Des Moines Register, uh, concerned again about what was happening with fashion, especially for women and the lack of modesty. And so uh, a woman who uh, had a low cut dress and uh, a, a low cut on the front and back and a high cut above the knees, uh, whether it be a bathing suit or uh, some other sort of fashion or short hair would be regarded as a vamp. And uh, Valeria Parker was out of Connecticut, but had been brought in uh, to Washington, DC to offer critiques and advice on better hygiene. She was also active in the eugenics movement, which uh, our Iowa Stories program a couple of weeks ago had some nice references on eugenics and, and the idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, better babies and, and better health. And so the moral decay that's happening and, and she's blaming in her case, the moral decay, not just on the women of the country, but on men and saying, you know, women are just trying to please uh, men and keep up with the fashion that men are pushing. And so the idea of vamps shouldn't just be uh, looked at through one lens. Uh, it's not that Dr. Parker was that open-minded, uh, but she didn't want to blame women solely for the moral confusion that some people felt was, was being 
promoted uh, by the changing fashion and changing hairstyles and, and other cultural factors. So again, this is all happening right on the heels of uh, the end of World War I and, and a lot of those cultural and, and economic changes that we've been referencing. And the term jazz uh, and the music jazz actually does go back pre-World War I. Uh, so jazz music was starting to come in, but by 1920, the uh, new cutting edge music that uh, young people and, old, and, and older generation, but uh, was, was really taking hold as popular music was jazz music and using a uh, community that's just across the Iowa line from Chester, Iowa, up in Howard County, uh, Leroy, Minnesota. This is an ad actually from the Lime Springs, an Iowa newspaper, Lime Springs is uh, also in Howard County. So on the Northern border, uh, you know, uh, just loved the ad so much. They, they couldn't put jazz in that ad enough on the left. So uh, Minnesota Performance Hall in 1920, but, uh, being marketed in North Iowa newspapers. And, you, you know, there's always the uh, counter pushback and, and coming out of churches and, and the clergy. And so an ad from the Muscatine Journal and News Tribune uh, in 1922 saying, oh, think maybe this is just a fad uh, that skirts are gonna get longer, hair is gonna be allowed to grow out and that uh, jazz may be, be done. Uh, the article that ran in the Muscatine paper, though, it does say, uh, well, uh, the pastor at the Mulford Congregational Church is hopeful, uh, not sure that it's really uh, going to be the end of uh, short hair, jazz, short, this is the very last paragraph. Uh, Our heart is restless until it rests in God. Uh, jazz, short hair, short dresses and such were created through circumstances only to make room for other fads prompted by other conditions. And as we'll wrap up, we'll say that it's not totally off base, but uh, as we will discuss, 1922 was not the end of the jazz age in Iowa. And in fact, there was a, a, a racial undertone to the critique of jazz. So you look at the Cedar Rapids Gazette from 1922, uh, early 1922, and, and references to jazz coming out of the jungle. And certainly, referencing that it, it's affiliated with black Americans. And so uh, jazz, this is the end of the second paragraph. Jazz is the hideous prattle of the undeveloped savage. Jazz is the bankruptcy of music. Uh, the thinking processes of children cannot be improved by jazz, nor can it develop the best in their emotional nature. Jazz will never fortify anyone's morale. Jazz is a menace to our intellectual and social standards. Jazz has a direct tendency to injure business and industrial efficiency for the entire influence of jazz is deterioration. Jazz is jazz, a clattering madness. And so affiliating it with the jungle, the idea that it is disrupting morals certainly puts a, a racial spin on the, a racial lens, I should say, on what jazz music music is about. And this wasn't just in Iowa papers, it was in papers across the, the nation affiliating jazz uh, with, with the jungle and barbarism or savageness. And so I think that's an important uh, thing to consider as you talk about this new music coming into uh, the state and, and nation. And, and in fact, it gets manifested as well in popular films. And so you've got things like The Daring Years that talks about the reckless, unthinking, jazz mad boys and girls. This was a film that played across the state. Uh, it, it actually was uh, you know, a fairly tame film. And of course, this is in the silent era as well. Uh, but you know, skirts above the knee, short hair, uh, wild dancing. These are, are parts of the threats that are viewed by uh, mainstream culture in the United States in the early 1920s. And again, through the early and into the middle part of the, the decade, you see uh, critiques of apparel, dress, 
and what uh, is happening. And, and the concern about short skirts goes back to local authority. Sadie Smith on the left-hand article is a police matron in Sioux City, and she's having a debate uh, with a local judge who certainly puts uh, a sexist lens on his response uh, when he gives a broad grin, when he says that he thinks that short skirts are okay, although not too short is what's in the second column, uh, the third paragraph. And, and uh, police matron Smith is, is concerned about the disruption that short skirts are causing in uh, Sioux City. And it's unusual dress that's suggestive. The judge says, I hope that the short skirt, although not too short has come to stay for it is sanitary and permits freedom of the limbs. So he's, he's putting also a little bit of a uh, uh, freedom and equality look at it too. But what I do consider foolish is the low neck silk hose and oxfords for winter dress and furs for summer wear. And if I don't remember to say it, one of the other concerns that was happening was that not just having short skirts, but also then rolling down your stockings. So for women to be wearing longer stockings that might go up above the knee, but then would roll them down to their ankles, that was then letting people see uh, their actual skin. And as the second column, there was a group out of Denver, uh, the Universal Pure Thought League. Uh, that's the second piece. And, and besides being covered in Sioux City, uh, the, the leader, Miss B. Hyde, also goes to Council Bluffs and is aghast at the dress of young women. And so in the uh, about the sixth paragraph on the left column uh, in that article, Down with Short Skirts, she says, nudity is one of the seven plagues mentioned in the Bible, declared Miss Hyde. Beauty contests are one of the worst menaces of the earth. And so just the idea that showing your legs is nudity seems absurd to us, but it was a serious concern uh, for dress reform leaders and those moralists concerned with what was happening in American culture. And in fact, that first paragraph, uh, you know, she says, if not to the ankles, at least to the shoe top. So for goodness sakes, uh, you know, would prefer that dresses go all the way down to the ankles, but uh, with shoes that went up over the ankle being uh, common of the period, can we you know, get them uh, at least to the top of a shoe? Uh, and so not only does Ms. Hines work in Sioux City and Council Bluffs get covered in the local papers, but the register actually also reported on her activity in 1926 and uh, the concerns and, and she, takes it too into a direction that it, it's going to affect women's health dressing the way they are, not just be a moral issue, but a health issue. And so comments that uh, short skirts lead to shivering and they get pneumonia or tuberculosis. That's the last paragraph on the uh, left column going up to the top of the right column. So we must have laws compelling women to dress modestly. So certainly looking at uh, you know, shaming women and trying to encourage, not, not just encourage them, but by law, uh, convince them to dress modestly. Now, of course, this doesn't uh, take effect legislatively in Iowa, but it, it's of serious enough concern that it's being treated serious, being, being regarded with uh, sincere newspaper coverage. And just as a kind of personal reference on that, here's a, a letter or a, a personal reference from a, an Iowa young woman. She was going to Simpson College uh, in Indianola. And so was staying there through the summer and writing to her boyfriend, Cleon, saying, I wanted to get a letter off to you this morning, but Aunt Mary went to Des Moines. That left me alone with dinner. Then I had to scrub an iron besides, so I had no time to spend this morning. Yesterday p.m. and last night I went to Chautauqua. Didn't get to bed very early. This p.m. I took a snooze. Then dad took Bonnie, Mina, and I out to Carlisle, Iowa for a car ride. Just got back. I'm going to Chautauqua tonight if it doesn't rain. It's a program put on by magicians. And then she gets to the controversial part. Cleon, 
I've got the fever to bob my hair. Listen, it's all coming out and I can't do a thing with it. They tell me if I bob it by the 1st of September, it will be grown out so I can do it up. Now I want you to, I want to know your honest opinion. I'm serious in the matter. I asked Mary last night her opinion. She said she thought it would do it good, but she hated to see me cut it off. I know mother and Bill will both have a fit, and I suppose you will too, huh? Uh, I, I know from research doing, she signs off as Girdley, by the way, a pet name, that uh, her name was Velta. Uh, she was originally from Ringgold County, but going to school at, at Simpson, and, and uh, both she and uh, she does eventually marry Cleon. Uh, they were both Methodist. And so this idea that she's going to bob her hair, A, she's asking her boyfriend whether it's good, but also expressing, I know my mother, and Bill was her uncle. I know mother and Bill, and she thought very highly of him. I know mother and Bill will both have a fit. That's the seriousness that uh, women, young women were feeling, or women were feeling uh, in what was still a very conservative state uh, connected to, to hairstyles. And, and I know there are uh, still, you know, dress and style is still something that uh, young people obviously are concerned with, but just to give it a, a more personal reflection from, from Velta there. And so all through the 20s then, there are critiques of what is happening uh, in Iowa communities. Uh, there had been a critique by uh, a uh, moralist who said Des Moines was full of vice. And so the uh, Des Moines City Council was considering calling a grand jury to ask for the actual evidence connected to the vice that the person was alleging. Uh, excuse me, sorry about that, hit the advance a little too soon. And so uh, cities truly investigating whether vice is any worse or not. Uh, you know, part of what the issue of course is, is with prohibition, you've got illegal alcohol consumption. And so that leads to uh, criminality, whether uh, it was socially acceptable or not. And so that's part of the, the vice idea that's, that's happening as we've got national prohibition in effect. And uh, it's being, ignored or violated across the board. And uh, another example of uh, Miss Hyde, uh, here's the Des Moines Register uh, take on the flappers. And again, looking at all these dresses above the knees, uh, stockings that may be slightly rolled to expose the knee or rolled all the way down uh, so that skin is being, being shed. So, uh, B. Hyde, again, uh, concerned about the conditions, and that's part of the vice that is perceived as happening uh, all across the state. <clears throat> and this, as my colleagues Matt and Jennifer know, is one of my favorite critiques and, and actual efforts at enforcement, and these happened again all across our state in the 1920s, were ordinances to regulate dancing. So this is the Northwest Iowa community of Rolf in Pocahontas County. And their ordinance that was put into effect of March 1923. And it has very strict licensing and time limits and regulation, but it also regulates the types of dances and music. So in the third column, so the center column of this clipping, uh, the second paragraph is the provision on indecent, immoral, or suggestive dances not permitted. Uh, this is section eight. At all public dances, such dances as the grizzly bear, bunny hug, Texas Tommy, shimmel, shimmy, toddle, Lorraine, or cheek to cheek and similar dances of a questionable or indecent nature shall not be permitted or allowed by the person or licensee conducting such dance. And then the next provision, provision section nine is about the music. Kind of music, jazz music prohibited. At all public dances, the time or the tempo of the music furnished shall be that adopted by the American National Association Masters of Dancing. 
that is, i.e., uh, they use the Latin abbreviation. So uh, that is the waltz, 40 measures to the minute, foxtrot, 40 measures to the music, to the minute. Excuse me. Jazz music is strictly prohibited. The next provision is no girls under 16 to attend, and it goes on. No improper conduct at public dances. No intoxicating liquor. The fact that they have to say that lets you know prohibition is not working, uh, even by 1923. Uh, must be kept in a sanitary condition. Policemen and police matron must be present. Uh, you must have these ordinances posted at the hall on at least two walls. Penalties for violations uh, were a $5 fine and uh, to up to $100. So these sorts of ordinances are happening all across the state through the 1920s, trying to regulate the morality of Iowans and you can find dozens of these sorts of ordinances. It just so happens that the, the Rolf uh, paper has a really good one, the, uh, a really good printing of one, I should say. And so that's why I, I chose this one. But in Sioux City, uh, there's an inspection by and, and a demonstration to a women's group of the types of dances. And so they try to sanction dances and auction up in Northeast Iowa uh, they're regulating dances. There's concern in Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, all across the state about indecent, immoral, or suggestive dances. And just love the fact that uh, those are named explicitly. The idea was cheek to cheek is, is the general term for what were viewed as indecent dances. And so one of the other things that's happening, and I don't want to get too much into it, but is tension around uh, the truthfulness of the Bible is manifested in the debate around evolution, and that is a debate that's taking place nationally when you think of the, the Scopes trial in 1925 in Tennessee uh, around evolution, but that had been going on since the 19-teens and in the 1920s, and the, the leading spokesperson who is involved then in the Scopes trial is former politician William Jennings Bryan, uh, had been a Democratic nominee and, and kind of shifted away from the Democratic Party and become more of a, a populist uh, through the 19 teens. And so uh, using the term a dust storm and evolution is a Drake professor uh, criticizing William Jennings Bryan and people who, you know, will follow him only because he's popular and uh, he doesn't really have a knowledge of science. And so seeing uh, the evolution issue uh, is being debated in, in Iowa and across the country. And, and again, don't want to go into too much detail, but that's just one other manifestation of how uh, cultural tensions between traditional uh, viewpoints on creation versus uh, the, the science that is developing around evolution. And so that's a, another point of tension within, our, within the nation and state. And uh, what I liked about finding this was that in the same column, so the uh, evolution story is the main piece that's there, but in the lower right is what I just highlighted there, the dancing degenerate. So here's a 1922 critique of dancing from Traer, uh, Iowa. So if all public dances bring about similar conditions to those that have prevailed at Harmony Hall southeast of Traer of late, we do not wonder that decent thinking people out of the church as well as in have been so bitterly condemning them. Things have grown so bad at Harmony Hall that the society has decided to bar public dances in the future. Not only has booze had a prominent part in the proceedings, but soiled doves without wings from many directions have been congregating here there. The latter might be barred from dancing, but that does not stop them. They congregate outside where thoughtless young men flock around them. The officers of the society have become thoroughly disgusted with the manner in which they have been imposed upon and have decided to end the disgraceful proceeding. So here you go, 1922 in Traer, Iowa. Uh, and we've got to just quit, quit allowing dancing because the old fashioned dance that was a saintly practice compared with the disgraceful styles of 1922 uh, can't be abided. And the music, although sawed off often by a country fiddler who never took a lesson in the music, 
was driven when contrasted with the nonsensical jumble of noises called jazz music. The world is growing better, but dancing is not. So uh, you've got evolution in one part of the paper, right below it is we've got to regulate these dances. And the reaction that you see in the most widespread effort then is the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in our state. And from about 1920 through uh, 1928, the Klan is playing major roles and the Grand Dragon was out of Adair County. So uh, this is from one of the articles that we'll send you that uh, my colleague, former colleague, now retired, Jenna Lee Swaim did uh, in one of our uh, popular history magazines. And she was able to get access to a number of the Adair County artifacts and show some of the posters, broadsides is another term for them. So if I say the term broadside, that just means poster. Uh, this is a, a poster from Adair County in 1926 uh, done uh, to celebrate the, the Klan gathering. And they actually had built or were building their own Ku Klux Klan hall uh, in uh, uh, Greenfield. And so the celebrating the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the Klan is gathering for a uh, public event, uh, plenty to eat and drink on the grounds. And so the Klan starts becoming active in 1920, 1921 in Iowa. And by 1923 to 1926 is, is at its peak. And just to give you a few other examples. Uh, another Adair County, probably about 1925 poster uh, where there's going to be a big carnival and entertainment, uh, several big bands and uh, will be bring your dinner and be entertained that there was an admission for this, but children under 12 would be free for that event. And then the Creston paper is talking just being a little uh, to the southwest of Adair County, and, and sorry if you don't know Adair County uh, well, Adair County is just west of Des Moines, uh, a little south of I-80, uh, mostly. Uh, so just one over from Madison County, if I've got my counties right. And so Creston being in Union County, just a little southwest then of Adair County, uh, has uh, a note in 1923 about what the Klan is doing and, and what the uh, questions they're asking and what ideals they're promoting. And so uh, certainly against immigrants, uh, certainly uh, against Catholics, uh, they're a Protestant group and they are against blacks, but our black population in Iowa, while significant, uh, isn't viewed as the biggest threat. And uh, when you look at the things that clan members have to uh, or are asked it's uh, is your motive prompting your inquiry serious what is your age what is your occupation where were you born how long you you uh, resided in the present locality are you married single or a widower were your parents born in the united states do you believe in separation of church and state are you of the white race or of a colored race do you believe in the principles of a pure of pure Americanism? Do you believe in white supremacy? What is your politics? What is your religious faith? Of what church are you a member, if any? What secret fraternal orders are you a member of, if any? Do you honestly believe in the practices of a real fraternity? Do you owe any kind of allegiance to any foreign nation, government, institution, sect, ruler or person. And then you had to swear on that. And uh, Paul Davis is the state organizer in uh, being in Creston at the time that this was, was placed in January of 1923. And so, uh, you know, one of the threats is that the shores, uh, that uh, we recognize the landing upon our shores of the ignorant, the vicious and the lawless of the old world. So it's Europeans, but the wrong kind of Europeans that are viewed as the threat by the Klan uh, in, in Iowa. And so it's really an anti-immigrant group uh, as much as it is anti-Black in, in Iowa. And again, some pieces that Jenny, Jenny Lee Swaim highlighted in that article, and we will send you uh, this list, 
Uh, here's a Klan float from, I think, the uh, an October 11th, 1924 uh, parade in Sioux City. Uh, it's out of some, the, some archives in Cherokee. So uh, the Klan was, was out and proud you know, across our state. You can find not just in small towns in Southwest Isle or mid-sized towns, county seat towns, uh, just about every town had clan, a Klan presence. And in fact, uh, one of the other articles we'll share is from uh, Dr. Dorothy Schweeter, the late Dr. Dorothy Schweeter. And she talks about uh, up in Marathon, Iowa, up in Northwest Iowa, up in the Rolf area at the same time that they are uh, talking about dance ordinances, the Klan is active uh, in, in the region. So uh, photo, as I said, from a Sioux City parade uh, in uh, 1924. And then here's a clan gathering, again, uh, out of that article that Jenna Lee did, it came from the Cherokee area archives as well, of a clan gathering in Cherokee in September of 1924. So uh, not just, you know, the evening gatherings is depicted here, but as we showed in the earlier image, uh, the clan is, is happily uh, representing their activities, putting notes in newspapers, uh, encouraging membership. Uh, Iowa has a, a sad but rich history uh, connected to the Klan in the 1920s. And that really does have a bearing for Black Iowans. So uh, a photo from about 1910, as communities like Buxton are being dissolved, uh, the white supremacist uh, ideals that are manifested by the, the Klan uh, make it harder for Black Iowans to find success in our state with, uh, you know, Buxton that uh, one of, uh, I wanted to say in 1910 census, so pre-World War I, there are only three counties that have more than 1,000 Black residents, and those counties are Polk, that's not a big shock, Des Moines. Uh, the second is going to be Monroe County, where Buxton, the mining community is, there are more than a thousand black residents. I think it's around 3000 total black residents in Monroe County in 1910. And then uh, Lee County with Keokuk and Fort Madison having prominent black uh, communities. So there are great and compelling stories of black Iowans, but as black Iowans try to find new areas of success in the 1920s, as towns like Buxton shut down, uh, due to the end of coal mining, it makes their uh, efforts harder to achieve success. And so don't want to overlook, uh, you know, the, the struggles that saying that the Klan is anti-immigrant uh, and anti-Catholic, it certainly has an effect on Blacks. In fact, one of the things Klan, the Klan will do is go into a Black church uh, during a service and leave a donation trying to earn goodwill with that black church and that happens in Des Moines. And saying if we can divide and conquer Catholics first or immigrants first and then Catholics and then blacks, that will lead to the white society that the Klan was trying to achieve across the country and in Iowa. And the way that is manifested is <clears throat> also seen in music. And so as a reaction against jazz, this really is when the old time fiddling contest is introduced at the Iowa State Fair. And so it's not just a nostalgia, but it's like, oh, if the state promotes uh, traditional music through the fair, that will help people appreciate the traditional music. And one of the big proponents, of course, of traditional music and traditional dancing is going to be Henry Ford. So when Henry Ford is building Greenfield Village in Michigan, where I work, he builds a dance uh, ballroom that is a stately ballroom, but he uses it to hold old time dancing and promote traditional music. And so the traditional music movement of the 1920s isn't necessarily about promoting uh, just traditional music, it's about promoting traditional culture. Uh, just want to give a shout out to my colleague Matt Beyer too on that uh, article that lists the fiddling competition 
Uh, it also talks about the Boone folks coming down the Iowa State Fair on August 30th. So he's a Boone, uh, was a one-time Boone Toreador. So I, I enjoyed finding that in the article as well. And the other way it's manifested is in music, as I said, is the Meskwaki uh, forms a, the Meskwaki, men on the Meskwaki settlement also form uh, a music uh, band. And so the, 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 the community band movement also develops at this time. And the Meskwaki settlement has their own community band. Uh, in some of the newspaper articles that I find, uh, they talk about them playing traditional music and very slightly will reference, but they can play syn some syncopated music as well. So the Meskwaki who you know, had been facing uh, adversity in their settlement from outside influences you know, are, are still negotiating the difference between being traditional in their culture and embracing uh, you know, what the youth are saying is modernism. And so you see uh, at least one man wearing a bear claw necklace uh, and traditional dress, but you also have got a saxophone mixed in there as well. So uh, the Muskwaki Settlement Jazz Band, or excuse me, band, they were not a jazz band, but that would be, and I'm seriously saying that would have been offensive to call them a jazz band. Uh, they were a, a community band essentially that traveled uh, mostly central Iowa, uh, but the Muskwaki were part of that movement uh, of doing traditional music to appear to be more uh, in, in line with mainstream culture. Uh, one of the other reactions then uh, that I just was, uh, you know, kind of uh, staggered to find is uh, there was a slow club that was organized in Des Moines. And so she's got a dress that's below her knee. Thank goodness she's got stockings all the way up the young woman in the dancing and they are not cheek to cheek again. And so that, hey, young people don't do that fast living jazz, short skirted, uh, you know, gin drinking men uh, lifestyle, be slow. Put the brakes on the fast pace, you younger generation. So uh, there was a short lived slow club in Des Moines to react against the fast living pace of younger Iowa. And so what does uh, end that fast pace of Iowa life in the 1930s. Well, or the fast paced era of the jazz, uh, jazz age in Iowa from 1920 uh, to 1933 is where I would say the jazz age to a degree is no longer seen as a threat. Uh, well, part of that is we've got both environmental and economic events with uh, the dust storms and Iowa is part of the, the dirty 30s is what it's called. And so 1933 and 1936, uh, we have major dust storms in our state. So you've got environmental uh, concerns and then economic concerns as well with the Great Depression really having a greater and greater effect in the early 1930s and by 1933, uh, more than a third of the nation is out of work uh, or about one third of the nation is out of work. And so, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the photographs of uh, people from Oklahoma and uh, the out migration from Oklahoma to California. Well, Iowa rural families uh, were also facing uh, a economic and, and urban families too were facing economic challenges and, and economic threats. And so this is a photograph from Ringgold County uh, shot as part of that same process that a lot of us know uh, from Oklahoma, but you can find dozens of photographs of, of Iowans who are struggling uh, in the Works Progress Administration, Farm Service Administration photos. So uh, the uh, Scots were a tenant family down in Southwest Iowa in Ringgold County. Uh, you know, her stockings or the older girls, young woman's stockings and shoes are, are very uh, well-worn. Uh, patching the wall with uh, what is either swift uh, box or nutrient uh, kind of feed. So uh, wallpaper that's, you know, in, in rough shape, probably a farm tenant house. They were a tenant family. So her father was a tenant farmer down in Southwest Iowa, their father. And the other things that happen are prohibition is repealed in 1933. So going back to Dean Darling, uh, 
a cartoon he did as uh, beer becomes legal in Iowa in early April 1933. And so there's Rip Van Winkle with his uh, 3.2 kick uh, beer uh, gun that he's carrying with his long beard because he's been asleep for a dozen years or thereabouts. And the men at the speakeasy, uh, kind of a German character. Uh, Spike presumably is also German. I'm surprised they don't say that Darling didn't satirize the Irish in that, uh, but more of a, a German satirization. Uh, and then the, again, traditional woman dragging her children away as uh, alcohol is returning to legality. And then while swing music is a variant on jazz, it's a different type of jazz. And so swing music becoming popular across our state uh, leads to a new style of dancing and also Latin dancing uh, like the mamba, mambo, excuse me, is uh, becoming more popular. And so dancing styles change. And also it's now been uh, 10 years, almost 15 years since those dance ordinances, it has been 15 years since the concern about dancing was coming into the fore. And so it had, styles had changed, but also the people that were concerned had either died or were, uh, you know, moving on to other concerns face, you know, facing economic concerns. So uh, those are a couple of the other economic and, and social and cultural factors that lead to uh, the end of the jazz age and the lack of uh, outrage that was taking place. And, and the Klan had started to fade off, as I said, in 1927, 1928, as uh, Iowans who weren't uh, supportive of a white supremacist group uh, started saying, hey, that's wrong. And so also the, the, you can say the moral outrage about white supremacy uh, shifted in the 19, late 1920s. And so you had that cultural factor. And in 1924, we had passed an immigration act as well to make immigration federally, immigration more difficult. And so that also affects the Klan. Uh, Dorothy Schweeter talks about infighting within groups and also just the critical mass in rural Iowa uh, being connected to uh, the decline of the Klan. So you've got those factors leading to some of the shift in acceptance or the amelioration of concerns about what's happening with youth culture. And so that is a, a really quick look. There's so many compelling and complex stories in this decade that I couldn't get into everything, but wanted to leave some time for questions. And so uh, I want to say thank you again, remind you of the next program coming up is October 28th. But with that, Matt, I'll take any questions we have. Well, thank you, Leo. Uh, we have a few minutes to answer some questions at this time. However, before I pose our first question, I want to remind our participants that you can still submit your questions through our Q&A feature. We are on a schedule, though, so please note we may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar. And here's our first question, Leo. Uh, do you know whether there was any significant organized or publicly visible resistance in Iowa to the rise of the KKK in the 1920s? Well, certainly the... Uh... NAACP organizations, Des Moines had an NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, was an organized group uh, against the Klan. And then uh, Catholics through the Knights of Columbus, uh, that was part of the reaction from the Catholic side of things was Knights of Columbus had been around pre-1920 in Iowa, uh, but you see more and more Knights of Columbus groups organizing, and, and that's to a degree, and, and it's not today's topic, but why uh, Italian Americans who are viewed as one of those groups not being real Americans, part of that old world group that's polluting American, true Americans, they want to be seen as real Americans. That's, that's part of the motivation around uh, Columbus days in, in Iowa, at least, or Columbus statues is because they're an oppressed group, Italian Americans are. And so they want to prove that they're real Americans. So some of those groups too are part of the reaction against uh, uh, the KKK. Uh, the 1920s had a lot of new technology, but how did the telephone and new communication advancements help shape that time period? Yeah, you know, and we didn't talk about the radio. That's really uh, another new technology too. Uh, telephone certainly, 
uh, allows for additional networking. Uh, and in some ways, uh, that's part of coming out of World War I with Iowa having had from Governor Harding the English only proclamation that Iowans know people can listen in on their conversations. And so even as the proclamation has been uh, repealed in late 1918, there are still German Iowans, especially who are concerned about speaking German on the phone. Uh, the telephone was a way to organize as well, though it really was more of person to person organizing for the Klan. And then uh, as we said, either social groups and uh, religious groups on the Catholic side that, that organized against the Klan. So telephone is an important new technology, but because again, most telephone systems, not, not most, I think every telephone system in Iowa is going to have a person who could listen into your conversation, if not just an operator, uh, neighbors uh, could listen into your conversation the way the telephone was. Uh, the telephone's important, certainly is uh, an important way for young people to talk, but not in the way it was by the post-World War II era. Uh, short skirts and dresses were highlighted as moral issues during this time period. Were there any clothing item issues for men during this time period as well? Uh, you know, it, not so much. I mean, it was to dress like a swell, as I said, there certainly was a stereotype of men, but there wasn't anything that was viewed as being immoral for men uh, from an apparel standpoint that I can think of. And I'm, I'm willing to say I could be wrong on that. I haven't looked hard at it, Matt, but uh, every critique you see is directed toward women. And you could say that hasn't changed a lot uh, to 2021. And actually continuing that point, um, how did the fact that more women were engaging in higher education, entering the workforce, or fighting for the right to vote impact how women were seen during this time period? Yeah, I, I think, you know, Jenny Barker Devine's talk that we sponsored a while back, and I think I had, it was Jenny, uh, yeah, Dr. Jenny Barker Devine, talking about the extension and things happening at Iowa State. I, I went back and looked at Iowa State University bombs, thinking again, Iowa State College being the more conservative of the two. There are certainly sidelong nuanced uh, lists to short skirts in the early 20s, but every single photo, not, I can't say every single, every photograph I saw, there are no short skirts in the ISU bomb on actual women in the main book. There's usually later in the advertising section. Uh, I think I read the page right because I was looking at it digitally, not uh, uh, at the actual Iowa State yearbook, the bomb, Iowa State College uh, bomb, where it was the naughty page. And it was about a 1923 photo page uh, in the advertising section where some Iowa State co-eds had on short skirts, but in the main part of the book sanctioned by the university, uh, in higher education, at least women in Ames were conforming with the main style. And so I think, uh, you know, again, you would have some pushback by some young women, uh, and it certainly allowed for a greater idea of freedom uh, within the period. And I'm sure when they were at home, just like referencing uh, Velta M., uh, she was debating in her mind, should she bob her hair? And I'm sure she thought about what her dresses should look like. Uh, so uh, while there was a greater degree of freedom and equality for women uh, in the 1920s, it was still mostly a burden on them as to what was appropriate. And this will be our last question, Leo. Um, but as a historian, how does living through a historical event like the current pandemic we are in, uh, change or alter your research or feelings of a time period uh, dealing with something closely related like the 1918 flu? Yeah, you know, it, it's similar but different. So that's, you know, it, it, history never really repeats itself, but you look at factors of destabilization like a pandemic and how it might psychologically affect people and say, oh, you know, either my uh, equality is being threatened or our uh, 
traditions are being threatened. And so seeing the reaction that took place in the 1920s can maybe give a little bit of perspective at looking at any time in history, whether it be after the Vietnam War and some of the tension that happened in the 1970s or looking at any period in history. You know, it's always hard to tell the difference between current events right now and what happened in the past. So we'll see what people think about uh, in the 2030s or 2040s, about 2020s. So thank you so much, Matt. Thank you everyone for joining us. Well said, Leo. Uh, and with that answer, we will bring this webinar to a close. And I think we can all agree this has been a very informative lunch. I think I learned a few new dance moves too. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many more great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. While you're there, you can look into some other fantastic digital programs, such as our Goldie's Kids Club activities for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again Thursday, October 28th for our next Iowa History 101 webinar. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thank you all.